four years since it was first presented to the Australian people, the Uluru Statement from the Heart has been awarded the Sydney Peace Prize. The document's two pillars, a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament and a makarata process to investigate truth-telling and treaty-making, have yet to be acted on at a federal level. But their implementation has become the gold standard for reconciliation and work to achieve both is underway in many states and territories. Indigenous constitutional lawyer and activist Noel Pearson was one of those who accepted the award today and he joins me now. Noel Pearson, welcome. Thank you. This is an award for all the Indigenous Australians who work to develop the Uluru Statement. What does it mean to you? Oh, it's... uh, I'm obviously very pleased. This is an important recognition and I think the the Peace Foundation's recognition of Uluru is a a very timely and important boost um, for the cause of recognition. Uh, That's what I'm pleased about personally, that this does advance our cause very substantially. And I think it's an important recognition of the work of all of those delegates from around the country that attended the 13 dialogues and, and the group that convened at the end in the culminating meeting at Uluru. Um, And it's a credit to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Pat Anderson and Professor Megan Davis, because, you know, unlike me, they attended all of the dialogues in all of the corners of the country. I only attended seven out of the 12 of them. They were there for every one of them. They carried the process. Really, I feel a bit embarrassed because the the leadership load was carried by those ladies, and I think this is an important recognition of, of their achievement along with um, many hundreds of others. What are your reflections on what has and hasn't been achieved in the four years since the Uluru Statement from the Heart was delivered? When I look from the longer view, this is a plus 100-year-old journey that we're on. We're just part of a tradition that Um, started more than a century ago. And if you count the original advocacy from Tasmania in the 1800s, this is a very long history that we are a part of. I mean, what we have to hope with all of it is that we are heading towards a final result. So in the longer view, I see this as not just a question of what has taken place in the past 10 years, since the expert panel was established by Prime Minister Killard, and the expert panel itself was four years after the then Prime Minister John Howard really kicked off the idea of recognition on the eve of the 2007 federal election. So this is a, this is a long history. It is a history that has yielded so few gains but this represents our best chance. What's your assessment of what's been produced by the co-design groups on a voice to government? Well, the, you know, the, the, that process is not yet complete. There's been a lot of twists and turns in various language that's been used by the minister and, and members of the senior advisory group that's been supervising the process. Some people have talked about a voice to government and a voice to parliament, sometimes both voice to government and parliament. But obviously the critical question here is we must be able to speak to the parliament about the laws that are promulgated by parliament. It's the parliament's use of the Indigenous affairs powers and territories powers that underpins, that justifies the need for us to have a voice because they're making special laws about us under those provisions of the Constitution and they should hear our voices when they exercise that power. Do you think a legislated voice, which is what Ken White has talked about, could be a pathway to a referendum? Well, the important point that has been lost in this debate about whether legislation should should uh, precede any referendum. Once you legislate, you have exercised a constitutional power. You've exercised Section 5126, the race power. You will have created a voice structure 
a representative body called the voice, you will have created that under Section 5126, the old race power. So what function does any future constitutional provision play? And this is the basic question that hasn't been considered in the public debate about this. You know, once you legislate, you've chosen the constitutional provision that you're going to use to recognise the voice. And, and that choice is an unfortunate choice. If you use, it will dismay Indigenous people who have always, who, who've been advocating that we need to move beyond race, we need to put race behind us, and I am one of those people, but there have been a raft of leaders, including Senator Dodson, including Professor Langton, Marcia Langton, a lot of people have written and said over the years that we need to move away from the language of race to the recognition of indigeneity. And it would be an unfortunate thing if we hung the new garment of the voice on the old hook of race. In a sense, um, you know, arch conservatives like Andrew Bolt have, have been making this argument that we should move away from race. I completely concur with it. The Institute of Public Affairs says there should not be, this should not be a racial construct. And I agree with that. Um, what I say is that this is an indigenous construct. This is a recognition that there are people, not of a separate race, but there are Australian people who have a special history in relation to Australia that precedes the coming of the Europeans. 87% of public submissions are in favour of a referendum on the voice. Do you believe this coalition government can really be persuaded back to a referendum? I think the issue is, you know, I've reread, and I urge everybody interested in this question to reread John Howard's speech to the Sydney Institute on the eve of the 2007 federal election. In the entire speech is dedicated to constitutional recognition. This is the first day of the campaign, and his first speech is on the subject of constitutional recognition. And in that speech, he says, within 18 months of the election, if I am re-elected, my government is re-elected, then we will move with a referendum of the Australian people. We'll move to a referendum of the Australian people. So it's open for both sides of politics to commit to that, to say, well, let's, we've got the design of the voice ready to go. We know what the legislation will look like. But the next thing we will do is commit to a time frame that it, within 12 or 18 months of the next election, the question will be put to the Australian people in a referendum. And so we have a brand new hook brand new hook in the constitution upon which we can hang the new legislation. Noel Pearson, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, PK. That's Indigenous constitutional lawyer and activist and today winner, well, one of the winners of this Peace Prize, the Sydney Peace Prize, uh, and that's all in relation, of course, to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This is RN Drive. Up next, it's the Drawing Room.